Good morning. It's the midweek edition of Business Morning. Thank you for joining us. I'm Ladi Williams. And I'm Chimeze Obi Iwago. Thank you for joining us. And good morning. Well, here are the major stories for us this morning. Oil prices rose nearly 1% this morning, extending overnight gains after industry data estimated U.S. crude stockpiles fell much more than expected last week, reinforcing bullish views on fuel demand in the world's largest economy. U.S. West Texas intermediate crude futures lift 60 cents to $66.29 a barrel after climbing to $66.45, its highest since March 8. Brent crude futures jumped 58 cents to $69.46 a barrel after touching a more than seven-week high of $69.64. Both benchmark contracts rose nearly 2% on Tuesday ahead of data from the American Petroleum Institute Industry Group. Traders are awaiting data from the U.S. Energy Information Administration due later today to see if official data shows such a large drawdown. The rise in oil prices to nearly two-month highs has been supported by COVID-19 vaccine rollouts in the United States and Europe, paving the way for pandemic lockdowns to be lifted and air travels to pick up. And... Uh Back here, the House of Representatives is asking the Nigeria National Petroleum Corporation uh, to review the 38 modular refinery licenses issued to indigenous firms in 2018. The House wants the uh, licenses of those who are incompetent revoked and issued to more competent firms. Do take a listen. In essence of issuing the licenses have been defeated, as beneficiary have not been able to put to them in use, which is more, which is fine product for local consumption and export. Results, only the Nigeria, the NPC, NMPC, to review the status of each of the licenses, revoke and reissue to them, to competent people and reliable operators. Also urge the NMPC to give technical assistance to do her started construction work to double the commerce operation to set up demand for Nigerians. Finally, mandate the Committee on Petroleum Resources up on that stream to ensure compliance. In the meantime, government, ministries, departments and agencies that perform almost the same function may be shut down in the nearest future. That's according to the Ministry of Finance. The move, they say, is towards cutting down the cost of governance and reducing unnecessary expenditure by the federal government. Let's take a listen. This is a policy dialogue initiated by the Independent Corrupt Practices and Other Related Offences Commission to explore and provide policy that can address induced wasteful expenses and sanitize the governance system in the country. According to reports from the Budget Office, recurrent spending of MDAs rose from 3.61 trillion naira in 2015 to 5.26 trillion in 2018 and 7.91 trillion naira in 2020. These figures exclude government-owned enterprises, the National Assembly and Judiciary. It is no longer news that... Stakeholders here insist this cannot be sustained. We need to work together with all agencies of government to cut down on costs. So we'll be reviewing the number of government agencies that are currently existing. We'll be reviewing their mandates. And then where we have agencies that are having the same mandate, we need to look at how to merge and fuse or, in fact, close down on some just to reduce the size of uh, expenditure of government. A major underlying cause of challenges being faced by governments in considerably reducing cost of governance is the element of corruption that tends to reduce the impact of efforts put in place. Investigations carried out by the ICPC shows irregularities in the expenditure of some MDAs, especially in the post-COVID-19 era. ICPC ongoing investigation of some MDAs indicate that government ought to urgently take stock of the areas of potential savings from budget abuse in order to forestall continuation of the practice. But the problem with us is that we, have, we seem to have too many people in the wrong jobs and too few people in the right jobs. So for instance, we are under police. But we have too many people sitting around in offices in you know, non-value adding administrative jobs. 
Recommendations from these experts include a reduction of the number of political officers, election costs, multiplicity of MDAs, and the numbers of federal ministries from 27 to not more than 20. They say this would largely reduce unnecessary expenditure and the cost of governance in the country. Well, Ladi, this is a, well, um, a welcome development. If the government can actually have that willpower to, exactly. um, you know, take up this action and um, reduce the cost of governance, which everybody has been saying For is me. part of the problem Nigeria exactly. has. But let's just hope they have the willpower to deal. Because we with have this. other pressing needs, and Absolutely. the cost of governance should be it. All right. Well, as part of its efforts towards reducing poverty in Nigeria, the Federal Executive Council recently approved the National Poverty Reduction with Growth Strategy put together by the Presidential Economic Advisory Council. The steering committee on the Growth Strategy will be headed by the Vice President, Yemiyo Shibajo, who will provide overall guidance for implementation. The Federal Executive Council also approved the establishment of the Nigeria Investment and Growth Fund. The fund will be structured like a private equity fund and invest in commercially viable projects in priority sectors. Damilari Asimui, senior analyst with Afrinvest Securities, will help us make a sense of these two initiatives, and he joins us now. Good morning, Damilari. Thank you very much for joining us on the program. Yeah, good morning, Chimeze. Thank now, recently, yes, we're talking about uh, the recent approval by the uh, Federal Executive Council of uh, the National Poverty Reduction with Growth Strategy and the establishment of the Nigeria Investment Growth Fund. Tell us the link between the two initiatives and their relevance to the Nigerian economy. Yeah, the Nigeria Investment Growth Fund uh, is created to serve as the funding vehicle for the National Poverty Reduction uh, with Growth Strategy. Let me provide a bit of background. In 2019, when President Buhari was re-elected for the second time, uh, in his uh, Democracy Day speech on June 12th, he made an audacious promise that his administration is committed to lifting uh, 100 million Nigeria out of poverty uh, in 10 years. Now, it was this promise that informed the president's decision of uh, changing the previous economic management made by Vice President uh, Yemi Oshibayo. In September of 2020, with uh, the Presidential Economic Advisory Council, which is chaired by uh, Dr. Doni Salami. Uh, for some number of months, we didn't hear from uh, this committee, probably because of uh, COVID concern. But earlier this year, uh, March to be precise, uh, this committee uh, presented their strategy uh, paper to the president, which is uh, what we have as the National Poverty Reduction uh, with Growth Strategy. It's the mandate given to them by the president to come up with a strategy like that that can help uh, lift a uh, significant number of Nigerians out of poverty. And uh, given the fact that uh, this project is a bit capital intensive, it is estimated that uh, for Nigerians to successfully lift the 100 million out of poverty in 10 years, uh, it will require about 1.6 trillion US dollars, which, given the current official exchange rate, translates to about 606. A trillion uh, naira, that's like four folds of our GDP. And annually, that will cost Nigeria about $161 billion. Uh, if we convert that also to naira, that's about uh, one, one, 61, uh, uh, 61 uh, trillion, so which is uh, far more than what the government can generate. And so in order to uh, make success of this uh, well-thought-out initiative, so the committee also came up uh, with, the, um, you know, with the idea of having uh, a Nigerian investment growth fund uh, structured like a private equity fund where uh, so-called accredited investors from development financial institutions, pension funds, insurance companies, and private sector, as well as diasporans, you know, will help um, uh, raise capital uh, to push through this, uh, this agenda. All right, uh, Dam Larry, uh, according to a 2018-19 um, household survey by the National Bureau of Statistics, it was established that 40% uh, uh, or 82.9 million Nigerians live below the national poverty line. You know, established that 137,000 naira per capita annual consumption expenditure. So, you know, but of this number living below the NPL, 72% are from the northern regions 
while the southern region accounted for uh, the remaining 28 percent. So given the height of insecurity uh, challenges in the country, especially in the northern region, do you think uh, there's any hope of achieving a countrywide reduction in poverty level um, through this initiative? Um, yes, uh, it has been established that, um, I mean, theoretically, as well as uh, data, that uh, um, pover high, high poverty uh, drives uh, insecurity. And so one of the reasons why we have 72% uh, of the poor Nigerians living in the north is the fact that the people around there have been in poverty. I mean, larger proportion have been in poverty for a very long time. Not just poverty in terms of inability to meet, uh, I mean, in terms of uh, um, living below the poverty, uh, I mean, the minimum uh, earnings benchmark of 137,430 a year, but poverty in terms of limited access to education, limited access to uh, health services, poverty also in terms of uh, um, lack of access to, uh, you know, decent environment, as well as, uh, uh, you, know, you know, clean uh, pipe and water. So all those factors in the past makes it easy for insecurity to fester in the north. And that's why, and, you know, most of the southern region, let's use Lagos as an example, you know, um, it's, it's, it's a bit difficult for insecurity, you know, to fester like that because an average person have one thing or the other to do. And there is a saying that an idle hand is a devil's workshop. So that being said, uh, this initiative, you know, will go a long way in, help, you know, restoring hope for a lot of people. And by so doing, um, the, 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 the level of insecurity in the country also, especially in the north, uh, northern part of the country, reduce because there is a strong correlation between poverty and insecurity. So if there is a strategy that is deliberately uh, crafted and you know, well, well, well pushed through, um, such that significant number of people can be you know, taken out of, the, out of the poverty trap, then I tell you, uh, insecurity issue in the country uh, will, will, will go down. So I believe that if this uh, agenda is, you know, is uh, given the kind of attention it deserves and is well uh, uh, pushed, um, yes, we can, you know, achieve uh, lifting uh, significant people out of poverty. As a matter of fact, we can reduce poverty level in the north to a single digit, and insecurity also will fade away. Mm. Well, Nigeria has a um, history of low revenue generation relative to GDP size and high public debt, which is about 32.9 uh, trillion naira as of 2020. Now, this position was what informed the idea of funding this initiative largely through a private capital investment model, I suppose. So how do you expect potential investors to react to this initiative? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, investors are always looking forward to two things. One is details, another one is transparency. Um, in 2017, Nigeria became the first African country to launch uh, a green bond, and it was a success because the potential investors then, you know, were given adequate details on what the investment is going to look like, as well as uh, how it's going to be spent and the likely return. So yes, I know that that uh, after the passage, I mean after the FEC has approved uh, this uh, national poverty reduction with growth strategy uh, paper, it is to be sent to the National Assembly for passage. So if by the time they, because the Attorney General is the one working on uh, preparing the bill, they sent to the National Assembly. So if uh, if this bill, you know, uh, contains proper details that will show to investors the um, commercially viable projects that will be, you know, that will be that will be done in different sectors of the economy, as well as who will handle it and how will the funds be managed? You know, just to see a clear cut movement of, I mean, a, a clear cut movement from where the fund is provided to how it is being used, as well as what will go back to the investors in terms of for any any investors. Bringing that, I mean, putting down their money. They're also looking, uh, looking, looking forward to you know having a return. But the first thing they want to see is having a clear-cut um, picture of what is to be done, who will do it, 
and now will the return be recouped, and now they will uh, they will also benefit from it. So if the government, you know, is serious with this agenda, and they, you know, map out, you know, the the the, the commercially viable project they intend to 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 you know put this funding into, and they show details of how everything will be done, including who will run it and how the investors, uh, you know, will, will get back part of their fund as well as the interest. I'm sure it won't be difficult to, um, you know, to attract investors. But in, in, in the situation whereby uh, uh, details are being sketchy and the government, are, you know, uh, prioritizing political um, interests ahead of uh, going, you know, uh, being, being playing with this agenda, then investors may not be willing to come in. Well, um, transparency <laughs> is a key, as you said, but uh, given Nigeria's history of policy inconsistency, you know, lack of continuity in government, do you see this uh, strategic initiative transcending beyond 2023 if approved by the uh, National Assembly? Yeah, that depends on if we get it right. Uh, unfortunately, there's been a significant lag between when the president conceived this initiative and when we are seeing the first action. And this administration has just four, another four years. Is, I mean, and currently the administration have used almost two out of the four remaining two. But again, two years is enough, you know, to 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 start a good thing. So if this administration can give this uh, initiative a good start in the in the next uh, remaining two years. Of course, when President Barry mentioned that we'll be lifting 100 million out of poverty in 10 years, it's not that we'll be there for that 10 years, but he knows that it's possible to put up a structure that even the incoming uh, government will not be able to deviate from and will deliver 100 million out of poverty. And I'll use the example of the telecommunications sector. In 2001, Nigeria got it right with uh, the privatization of that uh, process. Until today, there's no government that has you know, ruled this country that have not benefited from that, you know, single act, except for agriculture last year, telecommunication was a sector that, com that contributed most to the GDP. As a matter of fact, it was the fastest growing sector. So if this administration should get it right with this national poverty reduction with growth strategy, now, um, then it will not be difficult for uh, um, subsequent administration, you know, to build on that and, and achieve success. But if we get it wrong, like what happened, uh, in the privatization of the power sector in 2013, then this uh, noble agenda will be will be like some of the previous uh, um, fantastic ideas, fantastic policies that never saw the light of the day. Absolutely. And again, <laughs> building confidence is always key. So what for you would you advise the government to do to gain the confidence of Nigerians? Well, I think uh, the key thing that the government needs to do is to show sincerity of purpose, is to show um, readiness. Because like I mentioned a while ago, we've had a lot of fantastic policies in the past, talk of shopping, talk of needs, but government, you know, political biases do come in at one point, and this thing do kill, I mean, kill um, all this initiative. So if the government can, you know, uh, maintain not overstepping their boundary in terms of allowing the private sector where they need to function on this uh, initiative, and government's role is just to, you know, provide an enabling environment as well as drive the initiative, no excessive interference. I believe, I mean, Nigerians, you know, We'll, we'll, be, we'll be happy and be ready to support them. I mean, when the Obasanjo administration in 2001, I mean, demonstrated to Nigerians by being committed to the privatization of the uh, telecom sector, the whole country was, you know, was in, support, was in support of that. And I can tell you that that also played a role in the re-election of uh, President Obasanjo, that they did then President Obasanjo in 2003. So if this administration can, you know, show some level of commitment, I mean, this can also even work for them on the political scene in 2003 because if they lay a good foundation for this initiative, people will be looking forward to, you know, voting for someone from their party who can, you know, continue from this because it is a, it is a wonderful idea. It's a great project. And that's what Nigeria needs now, especially now that we have been dubbed as the poverty capital of the world. Mm. We do appreciate your time, Dam Larry. We do appreciate your time on the program. Enjoy the rest Thank of you, the day. Thank you, Dam Larry. Thank you very much.
Okay, we go on a short break, and when we come back, FX Commodities Market Update is next. This is Business Morning. All right, for AFEX commodities updates, uh, in 35 deals, over 70,000 contracts were recorded on the AFEX uh, Commodities Exchange in the week of uh, 26th of April to the 3rd of May, valued at 1.22 billion naira. Let's uh, get details from uh, Michael Martin, now Portfolio Manager at AFEX. Hello, Michael. Great to have you. Good morning. Thank you for having me once again. Good morning. Good morning. Well, uh, bring us up to speed with the week's activities at the market and the week under review. Uh, thank you very much, Ladi. Um, so, if you look at the table in front of you, uh, in front of you, over the course of the week, uh, we saw the total value of transactions traded on the exchange uh, go up by 103.33% from around 0 0.6 billion naira to close at 1.22 billion naira. Uh, the total number of contracts traded on the exchange also went up by 75.27% from around 40,127 contracts to close the week at 70,332 contracts. Uh, the total number of deals also went up in tandem by 133% from around 15 deals to close the deal, I mean to close the week rather, at 35 uh, deals. Uh, we however saw a bit of red with the Apex Commodities Index, which is the ACI, which fell by 1.52% from around 384.04 to 381.89. Uh, we also saw a significant decline in the Apex Export Index, uh, which fell by 8.02% from 159.35 uh, to 146.56. Uh, next, we also have the volume of contracts traded on the exchange. And if you look at the graph um, in front of you, you would see that we had very little activity across board except for maize, uh, which went up from 40,006 contracts to 70,001 contracts. And also with cashew, which went up from 119 contracts uh, to 300 contracts. All other commodities traded little to no volume at all in the week under consideration. Uh, with regards to price, the top and only gainer for the week was cashew, uh, which went up by 7.20%, uh, gaining 2,880 naira in the contract value uh, to close the week at 42,880 naira. Uh, with regards to the top losers for the week, we have cocoa, uh, which fell significantly by 15.86%, uh, losing 16,400 naira in the contract value to close the week at 87,000 naira per contract. Uh, next, we have maize, which went down by 1.04%, uh, losing 200 naira in the contract value to close the trading week at 19,000 naira per contract. And, and lastly, for commodities, we have soybean, which went down by 0.38%, losing 115 naira in the contract value uh, to close the trading week at 30,750 uh, naira per contract. And lastly, but definitely not least, is the Fair Trade Exchange Traded Commodity, which still remains unchanged uh, at 14,008 naira uh, per contract. And as we always say, if you want to get more, if, if you want to know more, rather, uh, about the commodities market, you can always Always go to our website, which is www.afxnigeria.com. And if you want to get involved trading commodities, you can always download our app, which is available on iOS and Android. Now, Michael, we are seeing commodities super cycle globally at the moment, but um, the prices of commodities on your exchange don't seem to be reflective of that. Maize price, for instance, is pretty high on the global commodity market, but um, we see maize down mm -hmm. on the FX exchange, and we see a couple of those um, commodities also uh, looking down. How would you explain mm -hmm. this? Um, so, I mean, one of the first things you must note, uh, especially when comparing local local Nigeria prices with the international market, is that the dynamics that underscores uh, both markets are different in some sense, right? So, when you're talking about maize prices in the local market, you're taking into account all the macroeconomics that underscores production, all the macroeconomics that underscores uh, the supply uh, the supply of those commodities, and then the eventual delivery. Uh, in the international market, it's sufficiently divorced from the physical market because what you would notice in the international market is the fact like that it's mainly futures that are traded and 90% of them are not for delivery. So meaning that a lot of people that are taking positions in the international market, they are taking those positions, right? mainly for price appreciation, right, so that they can make a lot of money, right? But in the physical market in Nigeria, uh, which is, of course, the country under consideration, there is a bit of the physical market infrastructure to take into account anytime we're reporting price and any time we're reporting the dynamics that, uh, that occurs in the commodities market. Right, uh 
All right, Martin, uh, we noticed that cocoa prices didn't move for months, uh, only to see a decline in, in the price. Can you explain, you know, what is happening in the cocoa market? Um, so, I mean, as we have alluded to in previous months, um, so we have seen a significant decline in the availability of the main crop, cocoa, meaning that uh, the season started way earlier in the month of August, and then it more or less had been drawn down till the month of uh, May, which, we, which is the current month that we're in. So the pricing that you're currently seeing being reported is what we refer to as the light crop, uh, which is significantly less... Uh, uh, um, heavy in some sense right the weight is usually different and usually so so the standard uh, the standard measurement for uh, for cocoa is usually if you have cocoa beans if you have 300 cocoa beans and you measure them for the main crop you would ideally get something just above 300 grams and what that means is that the average cocoa beans is above one gram when you're taking the light, crop, uh, uh, the light crop supply, which is what we currently have in the cocoa market into consideration, and you measure the same 300 cocoa beans, you're most likely to get something below 290, something, something around 280, or maybe even 275 in some cases. And what that essentially means is that the weight of the average cocoa beans for the light crop is significantly less, or is less rather, than what you have for the main crop. So because of that weight differential, you very often have a discount. Uh, um, you very often have a discount with the light crop in comparison uh, to the main crop. And why you're seeing um, that significant price decline. Um. And then we saw Cashew, um, you know, gaining, wondering what drove that gain there. I mean, so, for the, so after launch, um, we expected to see a lot of activity in the cashew market, but we didn't see. Uh, um, I mean, that could be due to a lot of different factors. Maybe a lot of people were not willing to participate in the market at the time. Uh, but what we are seeing or what we have seen in the past week is, this, is a lot of significant activity in the cocoa market uh, causing, the price of the cashew, uh, causing the price of the cashew contract to appreciate, particularly on the exchange. Um, so, I mean, it's a bit of the dynamics between the supply and demand for cashew. We didn't expect or we expected to see a lot of activity at the outset, which you didn't see, but we are now currently seeing those activities uh, uh, on the exchange. All right, now with the insecurity challenges in Nigeria, there is fear that Nigeria may plunge into famine as soon. Meanwhile, most farmers say there isn't enough uh, for the in uh, strategic reserves. Where and how does uh, the commodities market uh, play a role here? Um, I mean, so... I mean, and I think we've spoken about this um, a bit um, in the past, right? So the insecurity challenges means that, okay, as you have mentioned, that we might have food insecurity in the country. Uh, but one of the things that we do as an exchange, right, is our ability to leapfrog some of the current infrastructural deficits that we have in the agriculture uh, uh, value chain and then be able to guarantee supply, uh, the supply of commodities to whoever would need it at any point in time. And it also feeds into some of the conversation that we've had in recent time where we are actually scaling up our, our MP financing program, which is some, one of the major programs that we do as an exchange. Right, so last year we reached out to 35,000 farmers. This year we're trying to reach out to between 150,000 to even almost 200,000, right? So when you think about that in terms of the scale at which we might be able to increase production considering the food insecurity issue that we're currently confronted with, I, I think we as an exchange are, are, may, are taking steps um, in the right direction just from the point of view of increasing supply. With regards to the other infrastructural issues, I think we would need the help, help of other players in the agricultural value chain, particularly with the government, uh, uh, helping, us with, uh, helping us with the security issues so that the movement of commodities from one place to another can be more seamless as opposed to what we are currently having uh, as opposed to what we are currently having in the commodities market uh, nowadays so for us as an exchange first of all the ability to guarantee price quality and quantity still remains uh, pivotal for us as an exchange and then secondly the ability is through uh, our own impure financing program to increase the production numbers for small older farmers has now become uh, 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 more even more important than ever in light of the current uh, food insecurity and insecurity issues that we are having in the country all right, thank you very much, uh, uh, Michael. In the meantime, on the 4th of May, You're FX welcome. launched uh, its five-year impact report that looked to measure their impacts across five key SDG goals, particularly no poverty, low hunger, gender equality, decent work and economic growth, and responsible consumption and production. Well, to tell us more about this impact report is the Vice President of Financial Markets at Apex, Akinika Akin Tunde. Thank you very much, Akinka, for joining us. Good morning. 
Well, discourse on the need to achieve food security in Nigeria and Africa at large is now more important than ever in line with this. How will you say FX has helped over the last five years to contribute to food security goals of the government? To say that, um, as you rightly mentioned, there is increasing, increasing awareness around the need for food security um, for the country, especially after what we went through last last year uh, as regards the pandemic, right? Um, on the global and national level, the government is putting all resources in place to ensure that all the way from production, which is where you typically start putting structures in place to ensure food security, up to the point where you have already market, everything is available and works smoothly. As uh, so FX, uh, what we do is to ensure that um, we have access to um, smallholder farmers who are critical and key to these production activities. Um, production typically starts from access to quality inputs in a timely manner, which has been the gap for most of the smallholder farmers for producing these um, for a while. So, as so FX, what we do is to ensure that the appropriate structure um, that is required to ensure that the appropriate production that is required to ensure food security and the smallholder farmers are available and the smallholder farmers are empowered with access to the appropriate samples in a timely manner and very much more importantly access to the required financing that they will be able to carry out these production activities. And if you look at it, this ties directly to SDGs 1 and 2 which speaks to um, no cruelty and zero hunger. I would believe that if you could put a proper structure at that level, the ripple effect across the economy would be very, very much apparent for all key stakeholders. You, you might want to turn down your the, the, the volume of your TV there so we can uh, hear you better. Anyway, but at the core of uh, promoting food security, our smallholder farmers who produce about 80% um, of total commo uh, commodities consumed and available for export, uh, based on the capacity you play at AFEX, how would you measure uh, AFEX impact on smallholder farmers uh, in the last uh, five years? So... Like I rightly mentioned, right, the core of our activities are focused on smallholder farmers in terms of being able to give them the appropriate capacity to increase their production, right? Um, so what we do to a large extent is to ensure that um, the appropriate structure requires to first of all identify who these smallholder farmers are and are put in place. The call for any smallholder farmer, firstly, is that identity. Do we know who the smallholder farmers are? Can we identify them? Can we give them their proper structure? Financing is a key gap that has always been missing across all, all uh, production activities. And the smallholder farmers, as rightly mentioned, are responsible for the production of over 80% of the food we consume locally, right? So ensuring that everything that is required at the smallholder level is in place is required. Um, I like citing the example of agriculture being one of the highest contributors to GDP. At to at about 24% of GDP. But yet, access to finance or commercial capital available to this set of people is currently below 5% of commercial capital out there. There needs to be more efforts in place to ensure that these smallholder farmers have access to capital to be able to carry out their production. Mr. Akitude, we did appeal to you to turn down the audio of your television. We did appeal to you. I mean, that audio is not really coming out right. And um, well, we do appreciate um, your time on the program. We'll take a moment now. We'll be back. All right, let's check with the local markets. Activities in the equities market kicked off the week and month in the Bear Territory. Lafarge, Wapco, and MTN Nigeria were the major culprits uh, there. MTN Nigeria posted an impressive uh, first quarter result, yet investors sold off on its shares. What may have happened there, Ini? 
Yeah, thank you so much, Chimi. Well, like you noted, uh, they did uh, post their unedited Q1 2021 result yesterday, and service revenue increased by 17.2%, earnings before tax, profit before tax grew. But, I mean, since last week, we've been seeing a lot of corporate results in the market, but it doesn't seem to be uh, attracting investors. It seems like investors are looking beyond that to corporate governance and management of companies now before they make that decision. But let's just uh, look at the figures a bit before we delve into that discussion. The OSHA index was down 0.8%. 0.08% at 39,801.78. Equities cap was a little different, a little lower than Friday's at 20. 0.83 trillion naira. The volume, the value, the deals were up. A lot of sell-offs yesterday puts all of this in the green. They are much higher than yesterday. And yes, all the sectors except consumer goods was up. And uh, this was thanks to international breweries. International breweries drove the consumer goods 0.8%. 0.08%. International breweries did that alone. Every other thing, uh, banking and the top trade, the top trade by volume, the top trade by value was First Bank of Nigeria Holding and Zenith Bank, but uh, it didn't do anything, bring the banking sector to the green segment. Well, uh, uh, industrial goods was down, insurance was down, Lasaco was uh, very contributed very much to this. Oil and gas was also down. We have feel. Phil Anigbe is a research analyst with Cardinal Stone Securities to tell us more about uh, some of these happenings in the market. Hello, Phil. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, yesterday, MTN had an impressive outing with their corporate results. Profit before tax were up and all that. And yet, there was a lot of sell-off. How do we explain this? Yeah, when you uh, look at uh, this kind of reaction uh, put any release, it's sometimes to be a bit biased uh, if you are just looking at uh, the earnings alone. Uh, we think it's important you consider uh, the traction in that stock before the earnings was released. Uh, for instance, as at uh, Friday last week, anything was doing about 6% uh, week to date return. So you could explain that the seller you saw was some sort of uh, uh, profit taking by some uh, individuals uh, in the market, so profit taking after a decent week. And you remember, uh, this is a Q1 result. Uh, there was no uh, corporate action that followed the result. Yes, it was positive, uh, but then uh, only strategic investors uh, look at uh, uh, fundamentals alone. Those who are more tactical will be looking at uh, corporate announcements to see whether they can actually take short-term opportunities. But uh, we do think that uh, there are still uh, different opportunities for some uh, outside in MTN, even though uh, we acknowledge that uh, the recent events were largely driven by profit taking in our view. So a lot of corporate activities are, are taking place now. For instance, uh, GT Bank said there will soon be a shift or a reshuffling of their management. How do we expect this? Since you say it's not just about uh, revenue results now, it's more about corporate decisions. How do we expect all these announcements and arrangements and the management of all these corporates to affect in investors' decision? Well, we think that investors uh, react um, uh, differently uh, to different announcements. Uh, for instance, uh, following uh, CBN's announcement and restructure in terms of uh, the board constitution of FDNA, we've seen uh, some different uh, gains. I think yesterday it's also posted some different gains. So you could interpret uh, that uh, perhaps investors uh, analyze that information from a more uh, medium to long term perspective and they conclude that. Uh, the decision of the APEX bank could have like, a positive impact on a medium to long term basis. Uh, oh. For uh, GCB and some other banks, uh, there are discussions on uh, trying to uh, structure the institutions into uh, a, a whole co uh, structure to diversify uh, any base or ROE base that may be seen uh, as positive uh, by the market. But then for those kind of structure that I like to span, uh, I like to take effect over the medium to long term. Only strategic investors uh, look to that. The more tactical or investors seeking things like dividend yield will tend to be more short term. So, strategic investors will look at uh, the structuring that is focused on repositioning the business uh, in the medium to long term. 
All right. All right, Phil Anikbe, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us this morning. Phil Anikbe is a research analyst with Cardinal Stone Securities. Well, market breath yesterday was positive. 24 tickers gained and 16 losers in the unlisted market. Uh, we saw there was a gain there, 0.09%. Market cap at 561.46 billion naira. Um, 53 deals, transactions were 53, was 297.78 million naira, 9.8. 84 million. And then in Omo uh, yesterday, there was a bit of outflow. Some auctions matured yesterday. And uh, but apart from that, we had 25 deals in the Omo auctions market. Uh, the most favored was the 24th of July 20, 2047. Well, I think that's the most we can take now, Chimmy. So we pray for a better outing today in the equities markets. We pray so. And let's just hope that what we're seeing is not that popular saying. Um, sell in May and go in May. Right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll take another quick break, and when we come back, we'll do a crossover to London. All right, let's do an opening call to London. Juliana is there. Good morning, Juliana. The UK and India have uh, struck a deal allowing thousands of young adults to work and live in each other's countries for two years. Is this also part of the outcome of the PM's meeting with his India's counterpart, uh, Narendra Modi? It is. Uh, good morning, Chimise. Before I jump into that, it's probably worth bringing you a bit of breaking news, which is uh, that the Indian uh, Foreign Ministry has actually confirmed this morning that two members of the Indian delegation that were invited to the G7 summit in London have tested positive uh, for mm. COVID-19. This is a massive uh, story at the moment. Um, and of course, it does put into doubt what happens uh, with the likes of Japan, um, America and um, the Canadian delegation who are here. Lots of questions are going to be asked because, of course, Prime Minister Boris Johnson was supposed to travel to India. He mm. cancelled that trip because of the surge. And now we found out that two um, members um, have uh, tested positive. And, of course, they have been um, mingling with lots of the international community. I'm sure we'll be talking about that more later. But going mm. back to what you were asking, this is a significant development in the new relations that uh, Boris Johnson is trying to forge um, with India. I think um, a lot of people have been very critical of Britain's post-Brexit immigration stance, which is very, very strict and only really likes um, migrants to come into the UK if you are on a high um, salary, if you are highly skilled or you have something uh, to bring uh, to the table. But uh, Britain is very, very keen on striking uh, a, a free trade deal with India, not just because um, bilateral trade is worth £23 billion um, pounds every year. But of course, they are going to be a significant force to kind of counterbalance uh, the power that China has. And we know that India have always said that they want um, their uh, citizens, especially their graduates, to try and come into Britain um, without any trouble. So yes, this has been signed now. So 3,000 students, I believe, between the age of 18 to 24 every year will be allowed in the UK uh, to work and study and vice versa. British students can also go to India. Oh, well, that breaking news uh, is very, very serious. And um, that's actually the first in-house meeting of the G7. Well, I'm sure you're tracking that. And we hope to talk more about that later in the day. Now, let's look at some corporate news there. The UK's biggest furniture retailer, IKEA, uh, will launch a scheme to buy back unwanted furniture from customers to recycle them. What's driving uh, the group's shift towards this model? Yeah, uh, well, according to a statement from the Swedish retailer, um, they're doing this because they want to become a fully circular and climate positive business by 2030. A lot of people here in the UK do buy uh, secondhand furniture. You can buy them on several um, websites, including the likes of eBay. Um, and now IKEA are trialing this out. It's only a trial. It will be running for two weeks. And if it goes well at certain stores, they will uh, put this out nationwide so you can bring back some 
some items, not everything, uh, but bookshelves, cabinets, um, dining tables, um, and you will be able to receive up to £250, depending um, on its wear and tear. So they are trying to do this to try and keep the circular economy uh, going and to prove um, that they are taking this zero carbon emissions very seriously, particularly as households, I believe, attribute about 60% uh, to carbon emissions across the globe. And on data, after a Tory 12 months, car sales in the UK are finally on the road to recovery. Are you hoping to buy one anytime soon? I'll have to check with my husband, uh, but I think a big fat no is the answer for this year. Uh, but fortunately uh, for the car industry, uh, hundreds of thousands of people are. So uh, we've got the data from the Society of Motor Manufacturers and 141,568 new car sales uh, were signed, sealed and delivered in the month of April. Um, this is still pretty way off um, from the results that they saw in 2019. But if you compare this figure uh, to what was recorded this time last year there were just 4,000 sales. So this is a massive uh, boost. We know that um, car um, dealerships were closed for about three months. They were just given the green light to open uh, last month. So they are hoping that all this pent up demand, the billions of pounds in the bank that the Bank of England have been talking about will be used in the coming months as uh, lockdown restrictions begin to ease, Jimmy. All right, Julian, I'll see you at lunchtime. Thank you. Okay, let's look at the crypto market uh, with Laddie Williams. Laddie, Dogecoin, BNB, yep. and Ethereum, still yep. shining. Still shining, and Dogecoin uh, still taking most of that shine today. Uh, but back a cap here of $2.24 trillion, uh, dollars, down about 1.22%. 24-hour volume, $267.68 billion, traded this morning, up about 38%. Bitcoin dominance still dropping, 45.35%. Price of Bitcoin at this morning, 54425 down about 2.83%. Uh, let's talk to Gilbert Jopata. Hello, Gilbert. Yes, good morning, Mr. Ladi. Good morning, Gilbert. So, uh, it all started as a joke, a meme coin. But today, everybody is talking about Dogecoin. What's going on? <laughs> that actually shows the power of the community. It's not just about having a technology. If you don't have a community backing it and owning it, then I don't think such a cryptocurrency project is going to stand the test of time as that of George, as that of George has proven to us, which is reflecting as well in its price. In, in the early hours of today morning, some notable investors in Dogecoin uh, created a, a Twitter space and invited, uh, okay, the Wall Street Bet chairman invited Elon Musk and the founder of Dogecoin. And just within moments, we were over 9,000 persons and the price kept increasing. So wow. I was not surprised to see it reflecting over a 50% gain this morning. Massive run. Anyway, uh, Joe, what's in your portfolio right now? I hold uh, some major stock market caps coins in my portfolio. But uh, most outstanding, I have Digibyte in my portfolio. Digibyte also is a community-driven project, just like uh, Dodge. There, okay. is no, there is no CEO, uh, no company organization running it. It's purely community-driven. All right. So have, All right. So maybe one day Elon Musk might jump on that one. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, uh, but, okay. but, but you know you can't you can't tell the Dodge coin story without uh, talking about Digibyte. When in when in 2014 uh, Dodge coin was having a mining difficulty, it, it was the Digibyte developers that came to their aid by helping Dodge coin implement the Digibyte shield, which is used still this in okay. Dodge coin. All right, that's uh, quite interesting. <laughs> All right, Gilbert. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, what to watch now? Uh, let's look at the charts for at, uh, FTX Exchange. We see Bitcoin uh, for the daily chart still uh, on the bearish uh, uh, terrain here of the MACD cross. It crossed here, lost a lot of volume, 
and we have the KDJ also tending downward. Uh, key levels to watch for Bitcoin is the 52,000 uh, level and the 68,000. So, Chimmy, it, it's not looking bad, but uh, it's all about Doge. Well, the Bitcoin seemed to be losing its shine. First, it was Ethereum challenging its dominance. Now we're having Dogecoin. In fact, I was listening to Bloomberg this morning yeah. and then talking about the pronunciation and, of course, that icon, the dog. And then say, is it Doge? Or, or doge. doge. Some people will call it doge, <laughs> but it's D O J J. So it's doge, a doge. coin. Yeah. Well, perhaps that's the coin to watch. Remember, I told you. Uh, yeah, you actually you actually mentioned it, and, and I said uh, I won't touch it. And there <laughs> now, is up fifty five percent today. I'm sure you are regretting that at the moment. <sighs> In any case, this is not a financial advice as usual. Seek a professional advice before you play in this market. Very important. That's it on the program. Thank you for watching. I'm Chimeze Obi Iwago. And I'm Vladi Williams. Thank you for watching.